Well, this evening, as I've already told you, we are continuing in this um, really small series on the commandments, and we're looking this evening at the fifth commandment, which is given to us in Exodus 20, verse 12. The Lord says, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God uh, gives you. Uh, may the Lord bless uh, his, his word to our hearing this evening as we consider another way in which we should love the Lord. Now let me just mention that we're going to see, particularly in, in this commandment, uh, something that the psalmist talks about, I believe it's in Psalm 119, where he says, I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. As we understand the commandments, we do see where we fall short. And, of course, for God's people, God means that to be a blessing so that we can amend the way we're living and fall in line with the way the Lord would have us to go. But I say that to say that this commandment we're going to be looking at this evening is broader than just a command to honor our father and mother, but it is a command to honor and respect all authority that the Lord has placed in his creation. Now, we, we understand that, but we need to be reminded of this because, again, the distractions of the world, the way the world is going, the fact that we don't see this taking place, uh, particularly now with all the unrest in, in our particular culture, they're not happy with the way the process has turned out, and so they want to make that known. The Lord tells us that we are to submit to authority, uh, to all authority that the Lord has ordained in his creation. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. Now by way of review, you know we've been looking at the rules of the race. Uh, we, when we looked at the Reformation series at Eric Little, uh, we were reminded the Christian life is a race that we are to be running with our eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we are going to compete, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 9, we have to compete according to the rules. These are the rules. The rules, as we've seen, are also the law of love. This is how the Lord wants us to love. This is how he wants us to live. This is really the definition of what Eric Little was referring to in the last words he spoke uh, before he died, which is, it is complete surrender. Complete surrender to the Lord. Complete surrender to his will. Uh, willing submission to the Lord, not forced submission. Eric Little understood this is what God wants us to do, to show him the honor and the respect that we owe him as our God. This is how he wants us to love him. Now, this is what the Spirit gives us the ability to do in the new covenant that we've seen. It's the new purpose that he gives us, the, the form that he is using, as it were, to cast us in as he fills us with his fullness, the fullness of his life, the fullness of his light, the fullness of his love. These things are also what we should find ourselves doing, what we should be experiencing in our lives after the Spirit of God writes this law upon our hearts. And again, summarizing what we've seen, that we would love God most of all, that we would want to, uh, well, worship him uh, in the way he calls us to. Again, not just as we meet together on the Lord's Day, but with our whole lives to live as he calls us to, that we would keep our promises to him. Remember, uh, the Lord says that you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, which obviously does apply to the misuse of God's name that we hear often today, but primarily to the fact that when we promise God something, that we will do it. And as we saw this morning, it reminds us that we are to spend his day with him, that we are to set aside unnecessary work and any entertainments that would distract us so that we can spend time with him, spend time with the one whom we love most of all, remembering that this day that he has given to us is really a picture and a promise of what we are one day going to be doing forever with the Lord in heaven. 
It's a foretaste of the blessing that the Lord will pour out on us when we finally arrive. And of course, if by the Spirit of God we have been made sensitive to spiritual things, we love this day. We love the things that the Lord has called us to do. We love to worship Him. We love to spend time with Him. We love to pray and to praise Him. And again, this is just a foretaste of the fullness of that that we will enjoy in heaven. Now tonight we're moving into the second main section of the commandments. The first through the fourth commandment are focused more directly on how we are to love God. The fifth through the tenth focus more on how God wants us to love everyone else or to love our neighbor. Paul tells us as much in Romans 13 verses 8 through 10. He says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, it's interesting that the one he doesn't mention here is basically the uh, one we're looking at this evening. So it, it is almost like a, an, an overlap because what we're talking about is respecting and honoring the authority that God has placed in the creation for our good. So maybe it's kind of a commandment that overlaps. Now, Though these last six commandments are focused on loving our neighbor, we do need to understand that it's still part of what it means to love God since He is the one who calls us to do these things. If we love God, we will love our neighbor as we love ourselves because that is what He calls us to do. And I think it's important that we tie our ability to to love our neighbor to our love for the Lord because sometimes our neighbors aren't that lovely. You know, it's easy to love somebody who loves you. It's easy to love somebody who's lovely, but there's a lot of people who aren't particularly lovely. And they tend rather to draw contempt out of our hearts rather than affection. But we do need to understand that doesn't change the fact that we're still obligated to love them. Now, if we see these things that we're looking at, these commandments, as also being acts of love toward the one whom we love most of all, which they are, it can make our duty easier. We can love our neighbor, even the unlovely, even our enemies, which we're commanded to do, for the Lord's sake. In other words, we let our love for the Lord and our desire to please Him be our motivation to love those who are unlovely. Now, the first of these six commandments has to do with how we are to honor the authority that God has established in His creation. We do need to understand that He has ordained authority, that He has ordained it for our good. As I've already said, this is one of the ways He shepherds us. This is how He leads, protects, and provides for us in these different spheres. We need this authority. It is a good thing. Without authority, I mean, if there is no authority, you have anarchy, where everyone is basically doing what is right in their own eyes, every man being an island, every man being his own standard. And when that happens, of course, many people get hurt. When authority is abused, on the other hand, there is tyranny. That's when one person takes advantage of the many and the many, again, get hurt. By the way, the fact that tyranny is a bad thing is why so many people today, especially in South Florida, are celebrating the death of Fidel Castro, who basically forced so many people out of Cuba so many years ago, or they fled to get away from him, and haven't been able to return to their country because of the abuse that he had been perpetrating on the people there. But when authority is exercise in the way that God wants it to be. There is blessing. There is protection. There is order. There is peace when it's done His way. 
These are the very things the Spirit of God is actually, as we've already seen, working to create in our lives in particular, but He also has established this authority to work it in the creation as a whole, even though sin is constantly resisting it so that it doesn't turn out as He would, or at least as, as well as He would have it. Now let's consider three things this evening. First of all, that this commandment deals with all authority that the Lord has established. Secondly, how this authority is to be used and how it is to be submitted to. And then thirdly, the blessing that God promises to us if we will submit to this authority, if we will, in other words, love Him in this way. So first of all, let's consider that this commandment extends to all authority that God has ordained. The Lord tells us in Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now the first and foremost application of this commandment has to do with how we are to honor our father and our mother, the authority that the Lord has placed in our homes. And I think the Lord particularly wants us to do this because this is where it really needs to begin. And I think it's parents above all who have sacrificed and who have cared for children, who have done their children, what it is that the Lord would have them to do. Now, what is it that the Lord would have us to do as children in return to our parents for this um, care, this concern, this protection that they have given to us, the fact that they took care of us when we were helpless and we couldn't take care of ourselves, the fact that they provided for us uh, throughout our early lives, again, uh, protecting us from various dangers, teaching us things that we really needed to know about the world so that we would be safe. How does the Lord want us to respond to them? Well, the Hebrew word here that's used means this to make honorable, to honor them, or to glorify, although we usually use that term with regard to God. He is our Heavenly Father. We glorify Him. There is a certain analogy as to how we are to respond to our parents. We are to honor them. Now, what does that mean? Paul actually gave us a bit of an explanation earlier in Ephesians chapter 6 in verses 1 through 2. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. But I think it's also clear that more is included in the word honor than simply obedience. And here I'll draw upon John Gill, the English Baptist commentator of the 18th century, contemporary with Jonathan Edwards, where he writes uh, that this commandment, quote, chiefly respects immediate parents, both father and mother, by showing filial affection for them and reverence and esteem of them and by yielding obedience to them and giving them relief and assistance in all things in which they need it. And if honor, esteem, affection, obedience, and reverence are to be given to earthly parents, how much more to our Father which is in heaven. So Gil tells us here basically to honor our parents means that we are to love them. We are to think the best of them. And I think that applies even when they do things, and parents are not perfect, obviously, but even when we do things that are not necessarily good, we still need to think the best. As a matter of fact, we are to do that with everyone, not just parents. Put the best construction on the actions or the words of others that we possibly can, that they will bear, and perhaps even more so. We are also to obey them. Now notice he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. There are certain limitations uh, on this authority, on our obedience or submission to it, and we'll come back to this in a few moments. But he also says that we are to care for them uh, when they need it. They cared for us when we were young and helpless and couldn't fend for ourselves. And when they get old and they become infirmed and weak and helpless and can't take care of themselves, we are to do what we can to take care of them. Now, Gil reminds us, of course, that if we are to honor our earthly parents in this way, how much more our Heavenly Father? We read in Malachi 1, verse 6, 
A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. We do need to remember that our Heavenly Father is a father as well, and that we are to honor and respect him. The Lord has already reminded us of this, of what we owe him in the first and second commandments. But as I've said, this commandment also applies to other spheres of authority that the Lord has established in his creation because the word father doesn't apply just to parents. It doesn't apply just to the heavenly father, but in scripture it also applies to kings. It also is applied to prophets. And as a matter of fact, the word mother is also applied to queens. And that's because each of these is also given authority to serve as fathers and mothers to those who are under that authority. And the point here is that all authority has been given by God. All of it has been established by God. And so all of it is to be respected and honored by us. Paul writes in Romans 13.1, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Note this, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. We are to honor and submit to all authority, knowing that the Lord has ordained it and that he has ordained it for our good, which is what Paul goes on to say in verses 3 and 4. He says, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. A minister basically means a servant. The Lord has ordained authority that those in authority might serve you for your good. And by the way, notice here that the only time... You, you have a run-in, or at least um, as it should be ideally, with authority is when you step out of line with that authority and come into conflict with it. Do what is good, he says, and you will have praise from the same. Now, this applies to all the spheres of authority, as I've, as I've talked about. We have the home, we have the church, and we have the state. This applies to the home. Children are to submit to their parents, as we've already seen. Paul writes in Colossians 3.20, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Wives are are, are to submit to their husbands. We read in verse 18, Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Uh, Servants are to submit to their masters. Now, I included servants under the sphere of of the family because that's typically where you found servants was in the family. Uh, We'll apply it just a little bit differently in a moment, but this is what he says in verses 22 through 24. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Now again, we don't really have in our culture the idea of slavery, but we do have something that is like it, and that is uh, the relationship of an employee to an employer Because when you are hired by someone, you do become their servant during those working hours, and you do need to submit to the authority of those who have hired you. If you don't think you need to do that, you're not going to have your job for very long. Now, this also applies to the sphere of the church. The members of Christ's body are to submit to the elders that he has appointed. Now, again, as we understand the purpose of, of the authority in each of these spheres, it'll be easier to do this. But the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 13 verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. 
Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And this applies to the sphere of government. Citizens are to submit to the magistrate. Uh, again, we read in Romans 13, verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, one thing, too, that should also fall under this would be, uh, I think, the idea of, the, you know, the, the military. Because the military is basically a, a branch of the government. It is that which yields or wields the sword, at least one branch. The police are also a, another branch. Uh, that we submit also to that authority. Those who are the soldiers submit to those in command, and of course the police to those in command of that particular uh, armed force, which is more domestic than foreign. So to love our neighbor and also love the Lord, we need to honor the authority he has given to those who rule over us. Now, as I've said, this can seem like a difficult thing, until we understand why it is the Lord has appointed this authority. As I said before, it is so that there wouldn't be anarchy, that there would be no rule because that ends in really uh, the, uh, the, the harm of many people. And that he might prevent tyranny or the abuse of power, both of which, of course, hurt many people. This is what can make us afraid of submission, I think, is particularly this second part that those who have authority might exercise tyranny over us, the fear that we would be oppressed by them in some way. But we do need to see that this is not what the Lord intends. This is not why he ordained authority and why we should be able to submit to the authorities he has uh, ordained, particularly when they do what the Lord calls them to do. So secondly, let's consider how this authority is to be used and how it is to be submitted to. Now, first of all, the Lord gives authority that those who have it might lead, might serve, might protect, might provide for those under their care. Now, we noted last week that the likely cause of Lucifer's fall was when the Lord revealed the reason for his existence, and that is that he might serve man, more specifically those who would inherit salvation. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1, verses 13 and 14, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? We noted the reason why the Lord made the angels and why he gave them greater power and gave them this authority was not so that they could tyrannize man, but that they might serve man. And this is the same reason that he establishes authority in every sphere. And we see that specifically in Scripture in the commands given to each particular officer, as it were. To parents, he says in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. To husbands, he says in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. To masters, he says in Colossians 4.1, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. To the elders, he says in Acts 20, verse 28, be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And of the magistrate, he says in Romans 13, verses 3 through 4, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. So what he says here of the magistrate is really true of all authority. It is a minister of God for your good. God does not give authority to oppress. 
He gives authority to serve. Now, that doesn't mean that authority has never been abused, but it does mean that that isn't what the Lord intends. And he will certainly call into account anyone who misuses the authority that he entrusts to them. Now, if we have authority, we need to use it in the way we've just seen. If we are to honor and love our God with it, we need to use it to protect. We need to use it to serve. We need to use it to lead and to guide and to nurture those who are under our care. And again, we need to do it in the way our Lord Jesus Christ did because he really is our example of this in, in every area. He's, he is, in a certain sense, our father, certainly our shepherd. He's the one who provided for his disciples, the one who served them, the one who cared for them, the one who taught them, the one who protected them, the one who put himself out in front uh, of them and said, if you've come for me, then let these go their way. He is our example of how to be a father, how to parent, how to be a husband. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. He is the one that elders are to follow. And I would say his rule as king is also the example that governors, leaders, the magistrates, those who are in authority in our state should follow as well. Jesus is that example that we are to follow. So if we have authority, if you have authority, if you have one of these offices, use it the way that Jesus used it, not oppressing those that are under your authority, but serving them, ministering to them, building them up, encouraging them, providing, protecting. Now, if we're under authority, we've already seen, we should honor it again as our Lord Jesus Christ honored authority. As a citizen, he honored the magistrate. As a child, he honored his parents, especially as the Son of God. He honored his Father in absolutely everything. Uh, Jesus is our example in how to submit to authority as well as how to exercise authority. But again, let me just remind you, there are limits on authority. We are to honor authority when it is used within the bounds that the Lord has established. God's will is always supreme. And so tyranny is not to be submitted to, but rather resisted, at least as we can, within our particular sphere of authority. Some of you are familiar with uh, Rutherford's book, Lex Rex, which is basically uh, translated, the law is king. Rutherford was pointing out that the king was not given authority by God to be a tyrant. The king himself is to be subject to the law of God, and he is to follow it and minister that law. And if he abuses that authority, the citizens have the right to overthrow him. Now, I believe that Rutherford was drawing upon what we also see in Scripture, that when the authorities over us require us to do something that God forbids or not to do something that he has commanded, we must obey God rather than men. Now, I realize this is a little bit different than overthrowing uh, a king. So we have to think about whether what Rutherford says is to be carried out in the way he said to be carried out, but it certainly is true that we are not to submit to anything that is contrary to God's will. God has not established any authority that is over his own. Rutherford was right. The law is king because the law is an expression of God's will for our lives, and God is king. When the rulers of Jerusalem tried to compel Peter and John, no longer to preach the gospel, no longer to declare Jesus Christ, they replied in Acts 4, verses 19 and 20. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They might have added to this as well, we cannot stop doing what the Lord has commanded us to do. Now we do need to make sure that if we decide to resist authority because we believe that it's being misused, that it really is going beyond what God has commanded, we can also be guilty of rebelling against God if, if the real reason is because we don't want to submit to what the Lord actually calls us to do. In other words, if we're going to resist, we better make sure we're resisting 
on the right grounds because the Lord's authority has superseded that authority. So the Lord has established authority, that authority is meant to be good to prevent certain things such as anarchy and certainly he forbids tyranny. He has given this authority to be, uh, well, to, to minister to those under that authority. Finally, we need to see that there is a promise that is connected to obedience to this particular commandment. Exodus 20, verse 12. God says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, in the new covenant, I've already mentioned this promise is expanded from a long life in the land to a long and blessed life on the earth because in the new covenant, it, ex it extends to all peoples in the gospel. By the way, I draw your attention to the fact that Paul here is, is quoting the fifth commandment in a new covenant context, and he's telling us this is what we ought to do. And he even draws from the promise that was in the old covenant that was connected to these commandments, as we read in Exodus 20, verse 12. And he's expanding it because now the application is a bit different, but the promise is still there, and the commandment is still there, which is consistent with what we've seen in Hebrews chapter 8, that the new covenant is not the abolishment of the law, Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. And he gave us the spirit so that he might fulfill that law within our lives. But again, notice the promise is expanded. It's expanded from God's blessing upon the Jewish people in the land he was giving to them to all peoples, Jews and Gentiles, in the gospel, to the, the, the earth rather than the land. And he adds one other thing, and that has to do with it will go well with you. That wasn't actually a part of the original commandment. I suppose it was implied in the fact that the Lord was going to give them a long life in the land flowing with milk and honey. So if we will honor and respect the authority the Lord places over us for our good, if we will love him in this way, if we will submit to him by submitting to these offices, if we will honor our parents, if wives will honor their husbands, if employees will honor their employers, if members of the church, their elders, citizens of the state, our magistrates, it will go well with us. In other words, we will experience the blessing of the Lord. If we love the Lord, he will bless us. And he says he will give us a long life. And again, that is if in all things can being considered, it is pleasing for him to do so. There are exceptions, in other words. It isn't an ironclad guarantee. But it is a promise that he takes seriously. If it is pleasing to him to do so, if it will be for our good. I think we would all admit that a short, miserable life wouldn't be as bad as a long, miserable life. But a long, blessed life is best. And if that's what you want, this is how the Lord tells you that you can get it. By loving God, by honoring his authority, the authority that he has established. Particularly, let's not forget the immediate application. Particularly, loving and honoring your parents. So may the Lord help us to do that, which is pleasing to him. And again, if the Spirit of God has written the law of God on your hearts, you already want to do this. This is just basically the word go. You already want to do it. He tells you this is what he wants you to do. You know that. The Spirit of God will give you that desire to do it. And you will do it. And you will be blessed not only with a long life here and things go well, but particularly that length of life which the Lord has stored up for those in heaven, eternal life. Now, again, we don't earn that life. It's just simply the evidence that we already possess it because we want to do what the Lord calls us to do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us listen to what he says and, and honor him, give us the grace to honor him by submitting to his authority.